Hi, welcome to Operation Solid Lives. This is level one, and we're continuing on in the fourth part of our lessons. And this really is uh, the second part of what we began in our last time together, which is talking about God's dream for you. And I want you if, you, if you would just to review with me for a moment, we said that you're his daily delight, and he's working at getting that daily delight back. We said that sin has been the very thing that causes us to separate ourselves from God, to not want to be with him. And yet he's made a way now for you and I to have our sin handled through him, not by our doing. And we're going to really examine this. So I want you to go with me now to Matthew, Matthew chapter 21. And um, let's go to verse 33 of Matthew 21. And uh, remember... I, it was that wonderful prophecy of, of Jeremiah that needs to be refreshed in our minds also that where he said, uh, God speaking, I'm going to write my law on their hearts. I'm going to put my law inside of them. So they're not doing things out of compulsion. They're doing things because we're in relationship together. And here we have this interesting parable that Jesus talks about. And he says in verse 33, that there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and, and went to a far country. Now look at verse 34. Now, when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. And again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, Then they will respect my son. And when the vine dressers saw his son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Seize his inheritance. And so they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes... What will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, Well, he'll, he, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit of their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Have you never heard or ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous, is it not, in our own eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing fruits of it. Now this is an interesting parable that Jesus is giving us here. He's talking about servants who are prophets. They're the ones who came to Israel to speak to them, to warn them, to try to pull them back out of their stubborn hard-heartedness back to God. And who is the son, though, that's being referred to here? Of course, this is Jesus, God's son that comes. And we're told there, look, look, the, the vine dresser saw this in verse 38, and it says, come, that, that this is the heir, we, we, let's kill him. And then in verse 42, we're told that Jesus quotes this scripture and saying, haven't you ever heard that that stone which was rejected it, it, it may have been rejected, but it's it's got purpose still. It's going to become the chief cornerstone. And I love that. I think that is uh, something we need to be reminded of. No matter who rejects Jesus, including the Jews, who have still, many of them, hardened their hearts against the idea of Jesus being the Messiah, he's still the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. Hallelujah. Now, why did Jesus come to earth? Have you ever thought about that. I mean, that's an interesting question to ask because we believe, I hope you do, we believe that Jesus came to earth. He became one of us and dwelt among us. We read that in one of our prior studies. But look with me over at Matthew 22. Just go over to the next chapter of Matthew because there's a few answers that were given here. And find verse 1 of Matthew 22. Uh, it says that Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and, and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Now, he goes on to talk about people who were invited but didn't come. 
And one thing is certainly clear here. The king is Father God. The son is the representation of Jesus Christ. And there's a marriage being arranged. All right. Remember I said he's got a dream for you? Listen to the language that's being used here now. We're talking about something powerful, something amazing. A marriage is being arranged. And we want to go now to Ephesians 5 because I want to take this a little bit deeper because the Bible is really not a puzzle. It's not some mystery. I get nervous when I hear people. I know there's mysterious things about God, but God wants you to know some things. And you, you know what? You have a choice whether you want to know it or not. But God's making some things clear to you. And I believe you do want to know it. You wouldn't even be listening to me if that wasn't the case. But Ephesians 5 is going to help a lot. Look at verse 22. It says that he gave himself for the church. That's what he said. Well, you know the reference there. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Interesting. Why would that even be put together? I'll tell you why. God's dream now is something more than just preparing a place putting the law on their hearts. It's all good stuff. Seeing him with our own eyes, that's all great. He wants to be married to you and I. He's prepared a marriage for you and I. Now, look look at this. We we go on, and often, uh, you know, when this verse is referenced, it's usually somebody doing some teaching for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And that's good. That's appropriate. But I don't think that's the most important part. I think the most important part is, is that we need to know Christ loved the church, And gave himself for it. And because of that, we can continue on and know, look at this. We can know that that love was something that he did that caused him to lay his life down for you and I. My goodness. Verse 26. That he may sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. That he might present her, who's that? The church, you and I. To himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blemish. And now we come to, so husbands, love your wives, your own wives. And he says, as you love your own body, and he who loves his wife loves himself. So we're called the church. Christ loves the church. He gave himself for the church. Why? Because he wants to be married to the people of the church. Now, go with me to Matthew, back over to Matthew, and find verse 44. Matthew 13, 44. Chapter 13, I want to find the 44th verse. Again, here he's telling a story again, but what an interesting picture we're we're having painted. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a hidden field, which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it. Goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, I've heard this taught, and I'm sure you have too, that this is a a picture of our finding salvation, that we find out about what Jesus has done, who he is, even his love for us, and that we sell everything we have so we can have that treasure of salvation. May I say that is not what this story is about. It's not about you finding a treasure. It's about God finding you and calling you a special treasure. What could you sell that could buy salvation? What what could you go do that you could earn or gain anything for God? N- nothing. You, you have nothing valuable. Uh, how many know our righteousness is just like filthy rags? We have nothing. But he sold it. He sold it. And that's that's what I want you to see that this is all about. That relentless love that keeps working, keeps just trying to captivate your heart. And he's doing that, of course, in you and I. I hope you feel that. But he wants to do that through you to others. How does God communicate this kind of love? He doesn't send angels. He sent you and I. So we need to understand it. If we don't understand it for our own lives, how can we help others understand it? I hope you get a hold of this, really. It's about Jesus finding you. It's about him becoming your groom. It's about him selling all he had. So he could purchase that treasure. What did he have to sell? He sold his rights as God. That's right. This is what we call in in theological terms, kenosis. Where he emptied himself of all of his privileges and became human. Now, I love my dog. 
I, I've talked a little bit about Bella, and uh, she's a sweetheart. Uh, I'm not going to become a dog so I can get to know her better. That's essentially what God did. God became a man. Grab a hold of this. He became one of us. That's like coming down. When you say coming down to our level, I don't think we realize how low he had to go to get down to our level. I mean to submit his divinity and then come into the womb of a little girl named Mary. This this young girl. We may, Some estimate and scholars estimate that she might have been 16, 17. That would have been a, a reasonable time. Maybe a little older. We don't know, but she was young. And he... He put his life into her hands. Wow. Now, let's, let's go on a little bit here because I want to stay in Matthew and look at the same chapter, chapter 13. Look at verse 38. Chapter 13, verse 38. It, 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 we're told about the field here. Look at this. It's, and this is right in the context of that passage, this parallel. We're told in the parable of the weed and the tares. Look at verse 38. It says, the field is the world. Now, God's looking into that field. You see that? He's looking into that field. He's seeing you. He's seeing me. And his church, his people. And what does he want to do? He, he's, remember, he's, he's getting his delight back. You're his delight. We're, we're being brought back. And how, how is it? Well, look at that language. Do you think that's just by, by chance? For joy over the treasure well when you delight in something you get joy from it he gets joy from you because what you're his delight hallelujah so here he is he's made his uh bid for you he's purchased you he's sold everything that he had and he comes and he becomes one of us now how is it that he sold everything um what does that mean? How does that encourage me? That made me. That might make me feel more guilty. Oh, Jesus gave up so much. Well, let's let's try to do some examination here. First Corinthians, First Corinthians six. Find that and go to verse twenty. First Corinthians six, verse twenty. For you, point at yourself and say, "Me, me." <laughs> For I was bought at a price. Therefore. What do I do? Walk around guilty? Walk around feeling like, oh man, I owe God everything. Well, we need to know we owe God everything, but it says glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Why? Because they belong to God now. You're bought at a price. So, let's come back to Matthew for a moment. Go back to Matthew 13. I hope you don't mind me having you turn back and forth like this, but you need to get good at that anyhow. And, uh, Find the 45th verse, Matthew 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, we have no idea what God had to give up to purchase our salvation. I, I mean, we can, I think we have some concept of it. We have some understanding that there was a price paid for you and I. That's what the Bible's teaching us. But can I just skip all of the, the uh, how much he paid, but go more towards why he paid it. He paid it because you're valuable to him. You matter to him. The enemy will tell you you are worthless. You will never amount to anything. You, your, your life is futile. Whatever lies, and they can be so subtle. They can just be so subtle, like I've told you before. You could just end up on a shelf somewhere. You're not giving up on living. You may not even contemplate things like committing suicide or something that extreme. But you've given up dreaming. God hasn't. He's still got a dream for you. And he's worked really hard to get you to understand that. Now, Matthew 5, or excuse me, not Matthew 5, Ephesians 5 says something I want to go back to. And that's in verse uh, 28. That we're, we're coming back to this illustration of the husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And um, look at verse 29, uh, in fact. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Okay? For we are members of his body, of his flesh. 
of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. All right, now here, here's the picture I want you to see. He's not only proposing to you. He, he wants you to be betrothed. He's betrothing himself. There's an engagement that's going on. There's a wedding that's being prepared. And it says, look here, that that man shall leave. Look back at that verse. A man, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, we're told. But listen to what Paul says in verse 32. I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. Now, what, what's he saying there? He's saying Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was his daily delight, the Father's daily delight. He left heaven. He left his Father. He left everything. Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, I think about things that this world has to offer that you could walk away from. Pfft, nothing compared to what Jesus walked away from. What he left in heaven, why? Because he's, get, he's coming after you. He wants you. He's, he wants to be married to you. And we're told here that uh, we're, we know that he lived for 33 years. Now, I've heard people teach this in different ways, and this, this irritates me, and I, I, I want to clarify something. When Jesus was here for 33 years, it wasn't as if he left the Father, came to earth, kind of did this deal to solve the sin problem, and then now he's back where he wants to be with the Father. That, that's not what happened. What happened is right from the garden, right when man sinned, this plan was enacted that that seed of that woman would eventually crush the head. He may have bruised the heel, but that head of that snake was going to be crushed. And it wasn't crushed just by duty. It wasn't crushed just because God wants to take care of the devil who he's mad at. Well, he certainly is mad at him and he certainly took care of him in the cross, but he did it for us. He did it because he wants to be with us. Yes, the Father's delight was in him, but his delight's in you and me. Oh, praise God. Now, this is the reason a man, for instance, I left my mom and dad back in 1983, December 10th, and was married to Catherine Arlen Webb, most beautiful girl I ever saw. Had no regrets, still have no regrets. I don't know about on her side of the equation, but I can tell you I married way over my head. And I left home. I left my mom and dad and never looked back. I love my mom and dad, but I love Kathy all the more. She's my wife. And we spent our whole lives together. Now, why would God have this kind of picture being painted of the son, Jesus, his delight, having such an interest in us that he would be willing to be called our groom, that we would, he would be willing to identify with us as his bride? Well, I'll tell you why. Love will cause you to do that. That's what love does. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that kind of love. Now, I want to go on a little bit here. And I want to have you just think with me about the fact that you have a body. You have a body that's got maybe some problems. I don't know. You are you in good health? But you're going to die. I, I know that's not the best news to hear, but it's pointed unto all us. One day we're going to die. Well, who better would understand the problems that are faced in physical bodies like this, the prospect of death, the ongoing weakening of the bodies as you get older? And I'm going to tell you, it's not a lot of fun, is it? Well, who would better understand that than another person in a body? Who would better understand what you're going through than somebody that has also gone through it? Who would you want to talk to, to seek help from, uh, when you're facing something? You want to talk to somebody that's faced that, and not only faced it, but has gotten through it successfully. That's what Christ has done. So, this, this picture of marriage is powerful, beautiful. Um, unfortunately, for many of us, marriage is not a beautiful thing. There's a lot of divorce, all the the havoc and pain that's caused from families coming apart and people being uh, deceived and, and cheated on. Well, as bad as all that is, it's something important for you and I to start thinking about if I'm in a relationship with God through Jesus because he's now 
made himself to me as a husband and I'm his bride, I need to think about how I, I act, how I think, how I behave. And we, we start finding this through Scripture now. And this is where the New Testament starts to bring in those prophecies that we're, we've already looked at, but we're, we're told that there's coming this, this type of covenant that all people are going to be able to have. <laughs> Not just the Jews, but all people will be grafted in. And it's going to come, and it's, it, it's a picture of marriage, not just a, a legal agreement. All right, now look at Romans 7. Romans 7, and find verse 4. Uh, Romans 7, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married <laughs> to another. You, you, you've died to one, old relationship so that now you could be married to the other to him who was raised from the dead so you now are engaged let, let me go even deeper you're betrothed look at look at second corinthians 11 verse 2 second corinthians 11 verse 2 god says for i am jealous for you with godly jealousy actually so excuse me paul speaking here and he says, For I have betrothed you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul's saying to the church, listen to that language. You've been betrothed to Christ. I've led you to him. And that betrothal, that engagement, is not like ones that we have today. Um, a lot of engagements. And I, hey, I'm all for uh, when a couple's engaged and then they decide, hey, we're not, this isn't right. That's good they don't get married. This kind of engagement was binding. In fact, Joseph, do you know that it says that Joseph had a mind to put Mary away when he found out she was with child? Um, he could have, which was a divorce, he could have had her killed, actually. But he, he was going to put her away because he was, we said earlier that he's a good man and he didn't want any harm coming to her and didn't want to publicly disgrace her. Well, that's how binding marriage was in their minds. And it needs to be in your mind too. Why am I telling you that? Because you know what? God will never two-time you. He's not out dating other people. He's not uh, looking at stuff on the internet he shouldn't be looking at. He's, he's committed to you. Oh, yeah. Are you to him? Are you to him? Well, that's what we need to do. Now, Galatians 3 tells us even more on this, this score. Look at Galatians 3 and find... Um, let's, let's, let's go down to verse 29. Galatians 3, verse 29... We're told that we are Abraham's seed and we are heirs according to the promise. Now, that sounds good. I know that sounds great. And it is good. That is, that is just awesome. But if I'm an heir according to the promise, that means I have privilege. I have opportunity. Um, when Kathy and I got married, her and I became joint bank account holders. Uh, I know there's a lot of couples that have separate accounts. I don't quite get that because if the two are becoming one, you need to come. Everything should come under one roof. Well, uh, that's what's happened with us in Christ. Is that we? He's He's brought us in, made us co-heirs according to the promise. Can you Can you fathom that? That's what causes you to say to yourself, "Wait a minute. Why would I look at that? Why would I do that? Why would I spend time with something that's so contradictory?" are so against what my groom would have for me. Why would I do something that is so uh, two-timing? I'm not going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be motivated to realize I have the same promises given to me that were given to Abraham, and I'm going to stand on them. Amen? Now, go to Philippians 2, verse 5 with me, because let's get a hold of this, this, this idea of Jesus becoming human. Um, in fact, I want to just start with, uh, we'll just start with verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, all right? But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on the cross. 
So Jesus humbled himself. He emptied himself of his divine rights, his divine power. And he says, husbands, you're to love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself. Now, why, why is that that important? Because I want you to see here how much he loves you. He's not trying to just draw you up to another level. He's come down to your level. And the picture is he's kneeled down and proposed to you. Uh, when I proposed to my wife, I, I got down on one knee. I can remember exactly the spot at a campus in Point Loma University. I knelt down and I had a ring. Uh, it wasn't much of a ring, um, but it, there was a lot of heart there. <laughs> and I got down on my old bony knee and I, I looked up at that beautiful young girl and I said, Kathy, will you marry me? Now, she didn't have to say yes, but she did, thank the Lord. Well, the same proposal is being made to you by Jesus. He's kneeling down. He's come and become one of you, become one of us. And he's kneeling there. And he says, let's have a relationship forever. Are you interested? Are you? Would you receive it? Would you... Would you be a part of this? Oh, I tell you, that's happening all over the world right now. Now, did you accept his proposal? Well, you, you don't have to. You can harden your heart. And I know people that have. But here's what Jesus is doing. He's acting out precisely the marriage process. We've been betrothed to him. We He's given up his rights, paid for us, humbled himself. And now all we have to do is accept. That's it. We just accept it. We don't have to earn it, pay for it. Uh, but one thing we need to do, though, is we need to act like it. We need to act like we, we're, we're, we're taken. Mm -mm, we're spoken for. Sorry, I'm not interested in that. I'm not going to go with something that's going to be contrary. I'm not going to go with something that's going to be conflicting. I'm not going to go with something that's going to be uh, pulling me away from him because I'm in a relationship. Okay. So this is a very important motivation for walking in holiness. The more I walk in holiness, the closer I become to the Lord himself. The closer I get to understanding all that he's done for me. The more I walk in holiness, not only do I realize what he's done, but what he can do through me. Hallelujah. So you can't dabble in the world. I love that. You can't have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world you've got to be committed to him the way he's committed to you now there's a wedding day coming there's a wedding day coming and let me tell you about it turn over to revelation 19 would you revelation 19 and let's find verse 6 verse 6 and i heard as it were a voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. Who's the wife? Well, that's you. That's the church. It's us. And look at That's that treasure out in that field that he sold everything. He got a hold of it. Got down on his knee and proposed. She accepted it. And now the wedding day's come. Man, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. And you being this treasure, look at this. In verse 7, he says, The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, verse 8, let's go on. It was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And for fine linen is, uh, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to this marriage, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, that wedding is going to happen. I, I'm telling you as sure as I'm talking to you, even more sure than me talking to you, it's God talking. He's telling us there's this, this, this great epiphany event that's going to happen. What is it? The wedding day. Wow, how exciting. I love weddings. I love doing them. Uh, I, I don't think there's ever been a wedding I, I haven't enjoyed, even with some of the goofy things uh, happening with families and fighting and different things. Uh, I, I, even with all the strange kind of things people will do at weddings, I love them because it's such a picture of God's love for us. And hey, have you ever been to a wedding and you start crying? Why is that? Oh, because little Bobby's marrying. They're, I can't believe they're all grown up. Well, 
That may be, but I'm going to tell you why. It's because God has put eternity in your heart. You know somewhere down the road, you're going to be seeing him with your own eyes, and you're going to be with him forever. Isn't that wonderful? Now, let's finish some of this up here, because I want to talk about this wedding a little bit more. Look over at chapter 21. Hey, by the way, are you catching this? Look where we're at. We're at the end of the Bible. I've shown you from Genesis 1 to the last chapters of the Bible. <laughs> You're his delight. Listen to this. Verse 1 says, Now I saw a new heaven. This is chapter 21. And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there is no more sea. Then, then I, John, saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven for God, from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. <laughs> All right, you, remember the tabernacle, the tent? Put a tent in the middle. Uh, the final plan of God includes, He just wants to be with us. He wants to live with us. Now, as we go on here, it's amazing to me because what it says here about this wedding in chapter 21, we're still there. He said he saw this new Jerusalem coming down. And then in verse 3, it says he heard a voice. Heard a voice. Wow, what an announcement that'll be. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he knows that there have been scars there's been pain, there's been fractures, there's been all sorts of promises made that weren't kept. Well, it doesn't matter now, because look what it says. It says he's going to dwell with them. He will be their God, and they shall be his people. Why? Because God himself, God himself will be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Scars, pain, I, I, I know it's real. I know it's real, but there's something coming that's much more real than the pain. There's a healing, there's a wonderful culmination of our lives that'll go on for all eternity. Now, can I ask you something? Do you think we're gonna have to be begged into worshiping God at that point when we start to realize what he's done from the very beginning to the end his purposes, his plans, we would rebel, we would flake out, we would turn our, our backs towards him, and he just kept prevailing, kept prevailing relentlessly with his love. And now for all eternity, we're going to have realizations of how real that love was. Well, I guarantee you, no one's going to have to beg you to lift your hands, to give God praise. We're, there's going to be shouts of praise. We're going to be going on and on and on praising him. And, and just when you get done with praising him for one thing, all of a sudden, you're going to realize there's another thing he's done. You'll just be constantly coming uh, with understanding of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, how about the honeymoon? Mm. That's, a, that's the fun part, right? I, I mean, the wedding is one thing. You, know, you get some good food and all that kind of stuff. But how about a honeymoon? Yeah, because you want to you wanna be together, right? Well, look at Ephesians 2 with me. Let's, let's just go there and we're going to close with this. You he's made alive, verse 1 says, who were dead in trespasses and sin. You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. You remember when you were out walking around like that? Verse 3 says, Among whom you also once conducted yourselves in the lusts of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others were. But God, I love that right there, but God who is rich in mercy. Just say that with me. But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even while we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. And brought us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up together. And made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in ages to come. I mean, 
we won't even have time. So it's uh, you can't express it in years. But <laughs> you, the old song says, after a thousand years, ten thousand years, a hundred thousand years, whatever the time frame, it, it'll be irrelevant. But it'll go on for all eternity that we're going to be giving him praise for the things he's done. And what is it that Paul identifies? That he would show us the exceeding riches of his grace in Christ, in his kindness towards us. In other words, for all eternity, we're just going to keep realizing what he did, how much he loved us, how much he gave for us, how much he sold everything to get that pearl of great price, to get that treasure that you are to him. Don't ever forget that.